Welcome back, everyone, to the School of Greatness podcast. Very excited about our guest. His name is Tim Story. Good to see you. Thanks for coming in, my man. I appreciate it. Good seeing you. We're in Southern California today. Yeah, here at the Greatness Studio, and uh, we just had a great conversation. This is our first time connecting in person, and I'd actually never heard about you until someone said, I got to get you on, and then I started doing some research, and I saw one of your videos on stage with Oprah, and I was like, okay, if he's been on Oprah, we got to get him on. Exactly. And then just connecting with you for the last 30 minutes has been a a lot of fun. I feel like we're brothers already. So we are. I'm excited to dive in. And I don't think my audience probably knows too much about you, mm -hmm. I'm guessing. Because if I didn't know much about you before, then I'm assuming they didn't know much about you. So hopefully uh, people get connected and um, we'll tell them where to go follow you everywhere else in a little bit. But I'm curious. Now, you're a spiritual leader. You've been teaching uh, for two decades, more than two decades now, yeah, right? Yeah, long time. Long time, right? So... Um yeah, over 30 years now Amazing. that I think about it. 30 years. So I went to seminary. Uh huh. But I went to seminary to become a humanitarian. My hero was Mother Teresa. Yes. So I was going to be like the male, cool, chocolate <laughs> version of Mother Teresa. Yep. Went to seminary and realized I had a gift to communicate. And so I started communicating inner city schools, teaching on dreams, goals, you know, getting your act together. Mm -hmm. And then started working and it took off right and you've been doing uh you had a you did have a church for a while is that right where you were leading your church and now you'd also do a bible study you've been doing for years yeah so what Hollywood. happened is that i went through the traditional side of being clergy yes and so i had my own church and then i traveled like as a motivational life coach uh in churches as you know nowadays and a lot of people watching and listening it's the day of Joel Osteen, you know, you have these oh, churches that are like 40,000 people insane. now. It's amazing. So I was in my early 20s, I was going to churches of 7, 8, 9, 10, 12,000 people. It's still big. Yeah, I was speaking to 85,000 people by the time I was 26. So in my world, that's what I did. Yes. I motivated people using like the Psalms and the Proverbs. Yes. So inspirational literature to motivate people. Right. But you'd also share stories of real life instances and connect it back to the message and share it that way, right? Exactly. Yes. Interesting. Um, now, I'm curious, who was the most influential person in your life growing up? Uh, definitely my mother. My mother is um, a very strong lady. Mm -hmm. And we grew up in Compton, California. And my dad was a steel worker. My mother worked at a place called Winchell's Donut Shop. Okay. And my mother's whole thing was, don't do a halfway job. Uh -huh. <laughs> so we did nothing halfway. Right. Like, if you notice, for today, I showed up on time. Yes, you did. Early. five minutes early. Plus, I was calling your assistant. I called them twice really? to tell them I was on my way. Perfect. Because that's how I do life. I, love I it. My butt is up early. I show up on time. I do what I say. I dot that's my great. I's. I cross my T's. That's my mother, mm. inner city, Compton, straight up, get it done, boom. Be your word. Yeah, I love it. Okay. What was the biggest lesson you think your mom taught you besides that? Kind of like to man up, but it's like, mom, I'm seven. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So it was all about taking responsibility. Mm. So there was no excuses for things. Sure, sure. Like whether it was about school trying to make an excuse I couldn't go because I was maybe sick or maybe didn't do my homework. So it was always about taking responsibility, and that has been good for me even at this stage of my life. Mm. Do you think a lot of people don't take responsibility for their lives? Now, you're 100%. Life, you're a life coach. You coach a lot of celebrities, influencers, yes. you know, CEOs, successful entrepreneurs, um, probably a lot of people that you're probably not allowed to say their names, but a lot of people are aware of yes. who they are. Uh do you feel like those some of those people aren't responsible for their lives? I think that most people do not take responsibility, as you just said, mm -hmm. because it's so easy to fix the blame rather than fix the problem. Mm. And so it's somebody else's right. fault. And we really have become a nation of victims. Right. Of we've, we've learned these stories that work for us. And it's so easy to become a person that you feel like you're a victim. Then you have a family of victims, right? Mm -hmm. You can all just... You know, talk about your victim stories together and blame things and drama together, right? Yes. So uh, your life would be a lot better if you take responsibility for your actions, 
Even if it's super painful, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. What was the most painful thing in your life growing up, would you say? I would say people passing away. I remember when I was a kid, I was an athlete as well, and we were playing uh, touch football in the street. Never play tackle football <laughs> in the street. <laughs> yeah. If you know it's good for your arms. We'll slam it against cars and concrete. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I remember I was like nine, uh -huh. and this kid says, I can't play tomorrow because I have to go to a funeral. This is a true story. I said, what do you mean? He goes, oh, like my uncle died. I go, he died? Like, how come? Because when you're eight, nine, and ten, you're not thinking about death. No. So for me, for people to die in my family, my father passed when I was ten and a half in a car accident. My sister, who was only 20, died two years later in a whole separate car accident. That was, Wow. Wow. How that just invaded the happiness of the Story family. Right. And how many siblings did you have? We had uh, five children mm -hmm. in our family, wow. the parents and then the five children. So that, that was like a, a disruption. See, all of us go through times where we have life interruptions. Mm -hmm. Any call at 2 o'clock in the morning is not going to be positive. Right. There will be a life interruption that's not going to be positive. Mm -hmm. Okay, To find out you're sick, breast cancer, leukemia, Lyme disease, that's a life interruption. And so that was an early life interruption at the age of 10. And yeah. then what do you do from that? And were you uh, the only son or were there other did you have brothers? I had, I had I was the youngest of the of the family. I was 10, my brother was 13. But I will tell you that as you know that what you go through when you go through something, what's in you will come out. Mm. So my brother headed towards addiction, my other sister headed towards addiction, I headed towards sports. So really what was in us came out mm. and yeah. Wow. How do you think it affected your your vision for the rest of your life? Do you think if your father was around, you would have been doing something completely different, uh, maybe less motivated, or do you think you're more motivated because of that experience? I think that I would have been doing the same thing because I believe that this is the blueprint of who Tim's story is mm -hmm. and that the real you makes a demand on the person that you become. So even when you were playing sports, there was something in you where you were thinking about greatness. Mm -hmm. Uh, wanting to understand greatness. You were more than just a jock athlete. Right, right. So the real little Timmy story was already making a demand on me at 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. My, my family used to call me the king because they said, I mean, here we are, lower income, but you so don't think that way. Mm. I always knew that I would have influence. Yeah. I didn't know how to get there, but I knew I'd have it. You didn't know the, how the mechanism would be, right? Right. Yeah. So I think my father passing gave me more empathy for people that are hurting, that definitely was enhanced. For people who have lost their parents and haven't fully dealt with it, what's a process you think they could go through, whether on their own, siblings, family members, counselor? What's something you think should be their first step in just processing it or moving yes. forward in a positive way? Obviously, there's going to be a lot of emotions and fears that come up for people in that moment. But what do you think everyone should do? Well... In, in the book of Ecclesiastes, it says there's a time and a season for everything. There's a time to laugh, a time to dance, a time to be silent, a time to speak. There's a time to mourn. And, you know, a person's lifespan now, as most of you know, is around late 70s. People like us, we're going to live to about 103. Yes. Just so you know. Yes. <laughs> and I'm going to go out watching Sports Center uh -huh. at 103. You're going to hear dun 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 dun, <laughs> bam, and then there I go. There you go. But I feel that we have to understand this is life. Mm -hmm. Life is happy. Life is challenging. Life is mourning. Life is death. It's all part of it. So if we're fortunate enough to live a long time. A lot of people that we really adore are going to pass. Yeah. So when they pass, what do you do, Tim Story? Number one, you have to understand we all grieve. Grieving is an innate feeling of mourning that lasts on the average about two years where there's a strong grieving in your soul. Mm. 
Okay. Two years. Or two years. <clears throat> now, you will always have remembrance. It's hard to shake that grieving. Yeah. Sometimes mm-hmm. you don't need to try. You need to know that it is something in you that I think that even God put in us because loss is loss. So I say in your loss, think of the legacy. So like who has passed away that's interesting or was very important Mm -hmm. to you? My grandfather. Okay. Give me two things that he did that made his life Mm -hmm. so amazing that he left some form of a legacy. Uh, He was all about teaching. You know, he was a principal and a headmaster at a number of high schools and he stood for education and, uh, Education and also just like a lighthearted positivity okay. to him. All right. And his first name? Uh, Kimball. Okay. So for, for, for Grandpa Kimball, in that case, part of his legacy is sayings he said to you, mm-hmm. thoughts, right? Yes. Actions. Jokes, yeah. Jokes. So now you can pass those on to people so his legacy mm. Continues. continues. So take a piece of him and just use that with my energy and however I use that. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. I like that. And do you think it's wise to grieve with uh, friends and family members, or do you think it's better to do it you know, internally alone? I think grieving comes both ways. Grieving usually comes when you're by yourself. Mm. If you notice that if you've ever had emotional breakdown in any form or fashion, whether a relationship didn't work, See, when something dies, there's grieving. Yes. So we have grieving for relationships that don't work, jobs that don't work, dreams that don't work. So, in fact, there's a lot of people walking around today that are grieving, and that's why they're mad at you if Mm. they think you cut them off in a car or they're not nice to you at the bank. Part of them are they're grieving. Yeah. You know, when you get into grieving in older times, there were two things that people did. Number one is there was a posture of grieving where people would almost bow their back like something happened, someone died, Mm -hmm. I'm grieving. Mm -hmm. The second thing is there was a change in the volume of their voice where they went down to a whisper. Wow. And I said this to Oprah and she loved it. I said that life can knock the shout out of you. Interesting. See, when you're young, you have a shout. When you go into school, you're, there's a shout. You you never see a teacher going, all right, all you kids, pump up the volume. They're, they're like, shh, little right. Kirsten. So life can knock the shout out of you. Huh. So if you notice that if you've ever had a breakup, there is a grieving process, posture changes, volume changes. Wow. I love this. Um, you know, a lot of times I, people don't go after their dreams because of fear. Or they don't end a relationship because of fear. They don't get into a relationship because of fear. There's a lot of things that people don't do or do do based out of fear. I'm curious if a lot of the people that you coach, especially at the highest level, the top 1% that you coach, um, do they feel fear? And how do you coach them through the process of overcoming that? I think that everybody's fear is very unique to them. Hmm. And so... It's amazing how many A-level actors that I coach that are still fearful about will they continue to get booked. Really? Yes, because it's 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 such a competitive field out here. Yeah. I mean, we are literally in the middle of what yeah. goes down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So let's say you were Batman in the 90s. Mm-hmm. Val Kilmer. Right. <laughs> how long can you wear the bat suit? Mm-hmm. Is it going to be George Clooney next? Right. Is it going to be Michael Keaton before that? Mm. So there's there's a lot of fear that is unique to that profession. In sports, NFL, as you know, average guys in there about three years. Yeah, am I going to get injured? Is you know, am I going to yes. get the contract I want? You know. Okay. How about marriage? Oh my gosh, I'm so happy. He's so amazing, but now he's playing golf all the time. Mm. He's missing. Uh, he's not what it used to be. The fear of, is there somebody else in his life? Mm-hmm. How long will this last? So every fear that we face is unique to the individual. Mm-hmm. How do you think we should overcome when fear comes up for us, whether we're giving a presentation or any of these other things we talked about? What's a process we can go through ourselves to move through it and get to the other side? The number one thing is education. When you become educated about something, 
then it begins to dissipate fear. Like, for instance, like people who are afraid of flying, I will talk to them many times, even on airplanes. And I'll say, okay, let me help you with something. Right. You can get in an accident so much quicker and it's so much more common by driving a car, yeah. by walking in the street, <laughs> because it's not common that a big airplane is going down. Mm -hmm. So when you educate yourself on a subject that you are fearful, it helps to dissipate the fear. Right. To say it in a Tim Story rhyming way, when you feed your faith with education, you starve your fears or doubt. So you got to feed your faith and mm. starve your doubt. I love that. I love that. Now you started a um, a a Bible, uh, a Hollywood Bible study. Study. Yeah. In, is it 1992? 92. Right? 92. Uh, what inspired you to start this? Who comes and how has it evolved since then? It was kind of cool. 92. It started with Diane Cannon, um, who was married to Cary Grant at one mm -hmm. time. And it was a lot of older Hollywood that would come around. So anywhere from a, an Elliot Gould to a James Caan mm -hmm. to um, later in life, uh, Lee Iacocca, um, Charlton Heston. I remember back in the day in the early 90s, we used to have these answering machines. Yes. People still have them in certain remote and parts pagers, of America. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember one time during the early days of the Hollywood Bible study, um, you know, Charlton Heston used to call himself Chuck to me. He'd call and he goes, Tim, it's Chuck. When's that Bible study? <laughs> it's funny that Moses would call my house. <laughs> but we started in the early 90s with about 13 people and it evolved to now we have over 2,000 people wow. that consider themselves part of the community of the Hollywood Bible study. Wow. But it's more of who has not come. We we draw the biggest entertainers in the world wow. that either come or walk through or come when they're in crisis. Sure. So I think Amazing. a lot of people who do know me know me from I'm the guy that walks major celebrities through a crisis. Amazing. And where is that hosted? And where can they? Where can people find out about that? Yeah, we can go to timstory.com. Uh -huh. So I'm S T O R E Y. So timstory.com. S T O R E Y. And all the information is on All the book. information is there. Cool. And um, so that is an awesome thing that I do once a month on Sunset Boulevard. Yeah. We do it at an amazing studio. And this coming study, Oprah's people are sending the cameras to do another special on the study. But uh, it's, it's, it's an awesome thing. Again, mm. I use Psalms, Proverbs to inspire people. I love that. They come from all walks of life, all faiths. Come. Sure, sure. And what are some tools you use to get people to be present? You know, there's a lot of people today, you know, we were talking about this before, that we've got so many opportunities coming our way. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people who don't have opportunities but are just kind of walking through life, frustrated, maybe about their job, about whatever. What's something that you teach people on how to be present and fully in the moment with, yes. with all the, either the clutter or the opportunities that come their way? I think one of the easiest things that I do is I teach people just to stop, to look, and to listen. It's very simple. Stop, look, and listen. Okay. So let's say me and you are going to go see the Lakers. Mm -hmm. Kobe is finishing this yes. year. All right. So you're busy. You got, you're running like 27 companies. <laughs> I'm running three. <laughs> so, so you're super busy. But we've been excited. We're going to see Kobe. Mm -hmm. And let's say they're playing Cleveland and LeBron James. Mm. I'm from Ohio, so okay. Cleveland's my boy. So, there we go. So if we were to go and you did not stop, look, and listen, you're not going to be a great company. Because mm -hmm. I'm going to be talking to you, but you're going to be tripping. Right. Because your mind is going to like be everywhere, right? You're mm -hmm. not in the moment. Sure. You could be distracted by your phone. Yep. You could be distracted on your businesses. Mm -hmm. You could be distracted on what's tomorrow morning. Stop. Stop. Pay attention. Where am I? Mm. Oh, I'm at dinner with my mother. Oh, she hasn't seen me in three weeks. Or, oh, I'm on a date. So even before I got here today, mm -hmm. I had been talking with somebody who's pretty cool. He's going at it. I go, I got to get off the phone. He goes, oh, no, no, I got to talk more. I go, I got to get off the phone. 
10 minutes before I came here, I turned my radio off and I would not talk to this guy who's powerful because I wanted to get in the moment to mm. face you. Mm. So I didn't come in here with a bunch of clutter. I right. came in here in the moment. Clear, ready. Right. So stop, look, look, stop, look. Where am I? Pay attention. Listen. Mm -hmm. Listen to what is taking place around you. Right. Man, if you're by a lake, hear the ducks quack. Mm -hmm. Right? Be fully present, as you're saying, fully feeling, fully alive. Stop, yeah. look, listen. I love that. Uh, we were talking about meditation before we got on here. What do you say or how do you respond to people that say they don't have the time to meditate or they just don't think it's worth it or it's too woo-woo-y? What are your thoughts on it? Yeah, I think that meditation is simply what we're talking about and that's stopping mm -hmm. and it's shifting your satellite dish. So, you know, back in the day, you would have these big satellite dishes and we could go to somebody's house like in the late 80s and they'd be like, watch this. I flip my TV here and I get Canadian football. <laughs> <laughs> I go over here, <laughs> right, I get right, the right. Minnesota Vikings. Right, right. Okay? <laughs> so wherever you shift your satellite dishes, that's what you pick up. So again, if you're shifting it on my kid smoking weed and he's ticking me off, or I'm shifting it on I'm 42 pounds overweight, and that's what you're always thinking about, that's what you're going to pull in. Mm. Okay? All of the secret. Okay? The way you see it, yep. it comes closer to you. Same thing with meditation. If I shift my satellite dish to a place of peace, that's what's going to come towards me. Mm -hmm. So from a biblical standpoint, to me, I shift my satellite dish to the All Things Are Possible network. I meditate on the things of God. I meditate on biblical scriptures. Mm -hmm. I did it today. As soon as I woke up for 20 minutes, I meditated on Psalms 23 because that's what I'm into, and it put me in a really cool place. Mm, I love that. What would you say is a, a a daily ritual for you, maybe three or four things that are non-negotiable that you do every single day that you believe empower you to get the most out of that day? Okay, so I'm going to open up about weaknesses first. Because I speak for a living, mm -hmm. okay, 73 countries, I speak around the world. I'm on stage there is a buzz to being on stage. Mm. Mostly if the crowd's super big yes. and they're energetic. Yes. It's a high. It's a high. So I used to wake up as happy as I am, kind of down, like, oh, man. Man, I'm, why, am I, why do I feel so tired? Mm. But it could have been a phenomenal night. So one of the things that I do that I cannot get around is I get up and I either walk or run every single morning of my life. Mm. I don't care how I feel. I got to do it. First I, thing you do? I did it this morning. Wow. First thing I did is I meditated. Yes. So I'm feeding my spirit. Mm -hmm. Second thing I did, I went to the park that's not by far from my house. I walk, run, or I'm a basketball player. Ooh. So I go to the gym. I shoot baskets two to three times a week. We got to play some pickups soon. Let's do it. I'm there. We still got it. We still got it. <laughs> so... I mean, I'm 55 years of age, and I'm still hustling, wow, running. That's great. So I have to do that to stay in the zone. Mm -hmm. And balance. To be yeah. balanced. Yeah. So the meditation, the exercise, and then here's another thing. Every day, me and you have a bag of seeds. Mm -hmm. I'm going to sprinkle either good seeds or bad seeds. An attitude, bad seeds. Right. A grouchy little way about me, bad seed. Every day, I plant good seeds everywhere on purpose, mm -hmm. no matter my mood. Right. Whether I walk in 7-Eleven, tell people great things about themselves, right, right, right. motivating people, calling mm -hmm. my mother, calling people that they don't think I'm going to call them. <clears throat> Every day, I try to empty out my bag of yeah, seeds. I love that. One of the, the themes that I get from people that I interview like you who come on here is that we try to make someone else's day every day. And I think if we at least I like make that. one person's day every single day, that's pretty good. Yes. If you can make two, three, or the maximum number of people's day every single day with mm -hmm. whether going to, again, getting your coffee and just smiling or saying hello or 
paying for the person's coffee behind you, whatever it may be, mm-hmm. greeting people, just being courteous human beings, finding a way to make someone smile. I feel like that's a pretty solid day. Yes, I agree. That's good. Yeah, that's cool. Um, what do you think is missing in your life? You've had incredible success in a lot of areas. Is there anything missing? Yeah, I think so. I feel that um, for me, you know, coming from lack, I came from lack. So we wanted Converse, but we got something that were like that. <laughs> right. We wanted Levi's, we got like Plevi's. <laughs> Right. So I think I think that sometimes it's hard for me to grasp how blessed I am. Mm. Like I, I, I really I really enjoy what people are doing for me and how they treat me. Yeah. Because I'm treated really well. But I, I don't think I really really take it in the way I should. And and that's not because I don't appreciate it. It's almost like I'm almost afraid to pull it in so deep where I'll get too comfortable mm. and not stay on my grind. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Of course, yeah. So the very thing I, I teach people to to pause for applause is sometimes hard for me to do. Mm. Like I was in Rome a couple months ago. A kid from the inner city, I was in Rome. <laughs> okay, that's like my 12th trip there. And I'm sitting there at this really nice restaurant, 11 o'clock at night, because, you know, they're, like, eating late. Yes. And a, the friend of mine who does well was saying, do you understand how great your life is and the things you get to do? I go, yeah. I mean, it's good. Yeah. It's, <laughs> but, but I was almost afraid to just own it. Take, take it, it in. in. Mm. But does that make sense a little bit Yeah, to of you? course. So what do you – so what would the your coach teach you on how to take it in? What would, well, you, what would you teach someone else who is, or coach someone else into that? Yeah, I, 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 I think that, I think that I have to realize that I could take it in, and that doesn't mean if I take it in, it's going to go away. Yeah, like you're going to get softer, or you're going to get less motivated, or what do you mean? Well, what I mean, what I mean, number one, that number two is that I think a lot of people who are living above themselves, meaning they had a certain thought, goal, standard of what they thought greatness was, and they exceeded it. Where I'm at, dude, when I'm, were... pl- I'm playing in the bonus round. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I'm like playing the pinball machines, right, and, and balls are coming out. Yeah, yeah. So when you go from <laughs> like being normal and you're at these celebrity homes that are like $28 million and like, so Tim, do you play polo? It's like, <laughs> you know, in Compton, we weren't doing that much. <laughs> right. Interesting. I love it. Where do you think people should um... – we talked about dreams earlier, and you have a foundation where you have you, the importance of teaching kids how to dream. Yes. Essentially, how valuable is it for adults to dream who have maybe lost their dream or who have given up on themselves or don't believe they're worthy of having it all or having what we you have or what yes. they would want? How would you coach someone in thinking how to dream? Who've With, lost without that? a dream, you're not living because the reality is, is that Dreams are in us. They're in our DNA. We we were born with dreams inside of us. That's why you take any four-year-old to Toys R Us, yeah. and they go, I want that, I want that, I want that. And if you don't get it, they get upset. Right. Because they feel like you could fulfill that dream. Sure, sure. Okay? So kids are dreaming. I'm in Louisville, Kentucky. I'm speaking to a bunch of kids that are like seven, eight, nine, I go, what do you want to be when you grow up? LeBron James, what do you want to be? The president, what do you want to be? The little girl, a princess. Okay. <laughs> now, one of them said, I want to be bankrupt. I want to be married seven times. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so dreams are in us. Yeah. Right? So when you dial into the real you, you're a, you're, you're a dreamer. Mm. We're, we're all dreamers. Yeah. But as you know, and you do this and you write great books, is that some people have minimized their dreams and they have lowered the ceiling of expectation. You why, know, do, why do we do that? Or why do people do that? Okay, do here know? we go. See, this room here, it's a beautiful room that we're in. Great, mm-hmm. great space, great view. Thank you. And, but in, in America, you have to have an eight-foot ceiling is a standard. Mm-hmm. It's probably eight feet, nine feet, eight yeah. and a half feet. Yeah. So most people that I life coach were raised 
in families, the ceiling was lower than that. Mm. The expectation. Mm -hmm. Like, I like George Lopez. George Lopez says funny things. He (laughs) says, like, the whole thing about his family was, don't get pregnant, don't get pregnant. It was never like, go to Yale, go to Stanford. It was, don't don't get pregnant. Don't do something as opposed to do something. Right. And then one of his aunts, that would be called a tia in Spanish, said, you know, George, how dare you with these big dreams? You're going to end up on the streets. And he goes, yeah, I did. The Hollywood Walk of Fame. (laughs) So I think that a lot of us, the ceiling was so low. Mm. So in dreaming, man, you got to raise the roof. That's why people are reading your books. That's why people are following you. That's why people are getting in your school, which I think they should. That's why you have a presence because people are saying, dude, hook me up to the real me. Mm, I love that. Man, I love that. Um, <clears throat> do you always talk about dreams in your uh, speeches? Is it an important thing for you or does it just come up every now and then? No, no. It, it, is, it is the essence of, of who I am because my dream came true. And, you know, there are other dreams. What was your dream as a, as a kid? My dream as a kid was to be Tim Story, and I am now him. There you go. Okay. And, and so what that was is that that was I wanted to inspire people for their lives to get better. Mm-hmm. And so now when I walk in any airport in any country, people will come up to me and say, dude, I saw you in 97. I saw you in 99. Wow. I saw you in 2003. I saw you on Oprah. I saw you on that show. I saw you on Fox News Live. That is crazy. Yeah. So for that, I'm like, thank you, God. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm now waiting for what is the next assignment. And what is the next dream for you? Do you know? Yeah, I think, but but, but to say this, I I say it this way. There's a difference between a good idea and a God idea. Mm. I think sometimes people are messing up because they're trying to find some good idea for their life. In my way of thinking, I believe that God spoke my my life into my soul when I was a kid. So I want to just listen to what the God idea is for me. So part of the next God idea unfolding for me is doing what I do. And that is I have a church now in your Belinda called the, the Congregation. We have the Hollywood Bible Study. I mentor people. I get celebrities out of trouble. <laughs> Yeah, I'm unfolding. That's your current assignment, yeah. Yeah, that's my assignment. If you could see your life in the next 15, 20 years, like you were a child right now and you have this whole life ahead of you, as you do, what would you say would be the big dream if you achieved it? Well, I do a lot of studying, as you do. And I was reading um, I was reading some information on people's happiness. And you have, you have interviewed some of the best uh, coaches to talk about happiness. But a lot of people, if they let themselves, get real happy around 70. And so I, I'm a ways off from that. But but one of the reasons why is because they start to be okay with themselves, with their successes and their shortcomings. Mm, they accept it. Yes. Yeah. And it's that, that, that idea of I may not be what I want to be, but thank God I'm not what I used to be. Mm. It's like I'm 70, whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay? Uh-huh. So I think I think for me, I don't think like my 20s and 30s of what's next. But yet I got crazy good projects going on that I won't even talk about. Sure. But that's not what's filling my head today. Mm. What's filling my head is I was driving down the street coming to see you. Yeah. And then I'm going to chill for a minute. Then I'm going to go see somebody that's in the entertainment business for, for dinner. I'm in the moment. Yeah, yeah. I love it. Uh, you talked about the shout. Uh, what is it you said again? We lose our shout? Yeah, life can knock the, the shout, shout yeah. out of you. As opposed to the other word. Yeah. Um, so when it knocks the shout out of you, are we able to get it back ever? And if so, how? Okay. L- because I interview people too, and you're very good at what you do, give me two times life knocked <laughs> the shout out of you. Uh, playing... You know, my dream was to be a professional athlete. I, I made it happen, and then I got injured, and I had to retire. So mm-hmm. that was that was a big time. Um, big one. Huge one. Because you dream, did that all 
your whole life. life. And then the dream was over. That's part of how people saw you. Mm-hmm. You're tall. How tall are you? 6'4". Okay, you're like 6'4". Mm-hmm. And it was my identity for myself. Phenomenal <clears throat> shape. That's your identity. People see you places. Do you play football? And now you get, have to say no. Right. Okay, second time life knocked a shot out of you. Probably when my dad got in a car accident and uh, essentially he was in a coma for months and then – we had to teach him how to write and talk and read and, you know, go to the bathroom and do everything again. Okay. When I was in college and just not having my father to be my mentor and, you know, my father, he was still, he's still alive, but just yes. of not course. being that in a relationship, a completely different relationship. It's like I had to do, I felt like I had to do it more on my own without okay. him supporting. So okay. Big, so on a scale of one to 10, what would you say is the severity of what happened with your dad? Mm. Scale of 1 to 10, severity of what happened in football. Both probably 10s. Okay. Yeah. So those are two major mm. things in different categories. Yes. Okay? Mm-hmm. So part of getting your shout back, and don't ever forget this. In life, you could have the right plan, be the right person. You better be around the right partners. So much of getting your shout back is who's in your inner circle. Right. Because you're going to need to plug into somebody else's oxygen. Mm -hmm. How powerful is that? Absolutely. And so what happens, most people, when they get the shout knocked out of them, they isolate themselves. This happened to my dad. I'm isolating myself. This happened to my career. I'm isolating myself. Plan, person, Partners, you get around the right people mm-hmm. that are speaking life into you, helping you get out there, filling you with great things. <clears throat> hey, read that book, mm-hmm. listen to his podcast, watch that TED talk, whatever. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, get around the right people. It'll help pump up the volume in your life. I love that because you know there was times when I was growing up in middle school, high school, more like elementary, middle school, where I wasn't believing in myself. Yes. But that one coach that just saw something in me and said, hey, listen, Lewis, I believe in you. You got this. And gave me that extra little attention or that energy sparked something in me, someone I respected and trusted. Yes. It's like, okay, if he believes in me, then I can believe in myself. Mm-hmm. But if it was a coach that says, you suck, you're not worth anything, right. you know, it's going to put me down in a downward spiral. And so. the, the interesting thing about your life is, mm-hmm. is this, is that – Part of these setbacks that have taken place, even with you in sports, Mm -hmm. have brought you to that best-selling book, The School of Greatness. Absolutely. Because because of the adversity, Mm -hmm. right, it helped bring something inside of you out. One of the chapters is called Turning Adversity into Your Advantage. Ah. And seeing it as the opportunity and the lesson that how can I use this to serve myself and others around me yes. from these lessons. So, mm-hmm. But we're, like you said, a lot of people shy away or isolate when the adversity hits. So I think that's really powerful. Um, I like that. What was, do you think is the most uh, adverse time in your adult life? Um, I would say, and I don't talk about it much, but going through a divorce. Mm-hmm. I never thought I was a guy who would get divorced. Um, when I was in high school, I was funny. I was happy. I played sports. I never had like bad breakups with anybody. Mm -hmm. And to think that as an adult, you can go through life and then it didn't work. Man, there was a lot of guilt, shame, pain in that. Mm -hmm. And I think that most people have treated me really fair about that because either if they haven't been through a divorce, maybe their parents did or somebody that they care about. So I think a lot of it was about not meeting my own personal expectations. Mm. And it <clears throat> took me to a place of, of guilt and shame that took me years really? to fight through. When did this happen? It was years ago, but it took me years to fight through, wow. like truly. And so that was that was a different thing. But, but now that I uh, reflect, I was definitely going through mourning and grieving. Because remember mm-hmm. we talked about grieving? Of course. So, you know, divorce is divided force. So you have force, now you have divided force. So no wonder you feel like you're freaking getting (laughs) ripped. (laughs) Right, right. Wow. Yeah, but but now I do a lot of things. Um, 
I write for a, a website called First Wives World that has a lot of people that follow, and I do conferences for them. And so, I mean, I'm able to speak out and help a lot of people that have been through mm -hmm. challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't get so deep into my story because I have respect for sure. my ex, but I think that, um, you know, we all go through some form of divorce. Of that course. was that was yeah, yeah. that was the biggest thing I think I've had yeah. to face as an adult. I bet, I can only imagine. Um, talk to me about forgiveness and how powerful is forgiveness for yourselves and for forgiving others. Well, the the more successful you become, and if you learn from the school of greatness, <laughs> whoa, crazy stuff's gonna come at you. Mm -hmm. The um, bigger the dream, the bigger the obstacles. Yeah, right? I only have like eight <laughs> stalkers now. I think I used to have 13, <laughs> but they're bona fide. Yes. And so it's amazing that when you start doing well, it can bring out the best in people. Mm -hmm. And it can bring out the worst in people. Yeah. So I've had people steal money from me from the inside, try to hurt me from the inside, which again, I could not believe because I was the nice guy. Right. I could not believe this stuff was coming. Mm -hmm. But the more I talk about this, everybody has these stories. Yes. Whether it happened from their own brother or sister mm -hmm. or their own mother tried to sabotage them. Yeah. So if you don't forgive, forget and go forward. Okay. You'll retain, remember, and regress. So you have a choice. Wow. Are you going to forgive? Forget and go forward or retain, remember, and regress. So it is a choice. If it's in the category of your ex, for all you that are watching and listening, man, you got to forgive, forget, go forward. See, it's or not. You're be holding on to that in the next You're holding place, on to it. Yeah, yeah. And so I don't go for it when they say, when they say, you know what? I forgive, but I don't forget. <laughs> right. Well, right. then. You just missed it. Right. Because what's going to happen, you're going to retain, remember, and you're going to regress. And it's going to hold you back from your greatness in the next whatever. 100%. Yeah. Then you're going to have triggers. Oh, yes. Now, here's a difficult Here's a difficult. I've thing. had many triggers in my life that I've overcome. Because right down the street over here is Sunset Boulevard. Uh -huh. Now, I, I work with people that have big billboards of their exes. Up oh. on Sunset Boulevard. Oh. So could you imagine? In the next movie or whatever, right. yeah. Exactly. You're rolling down the street. <laughs> oh, my God. You <laughs> see your half-naked ex on the billboard. <laughs> that, that's what happens. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, if you, but if you forgive, forget. There's no trigger when you see that. There's no trigger. Yeah. So, I, can, I help people stop the triggers. I'm how, good at that. How do you forgive? If, something, if you feel like someone's done something so wrong to you or if that's your story, Yes. That someone's done something wrong to you. Or, and how do you forgive yourself if you feel like, man, I just committed something really bad to okay. someone. Or I cheated or did this or you know, abused them in some way. How does someone forgive them, themselves or others? Okay. So to forgive someone else, number one, you got to look at how has this impacted my life? Okay. So again, let's say if somebody left you or hurt you or stole money from you. So... Or abused you. It's a major mm -hmm. thing. How is this affecting my life? When you take inventory and you say, ooh, but now I don't trust men. Mm -hmm. Or now I don't trust women. Right? Now I become cynical. So when you take inventory and realize, man, that has affected my life. Okay? So what do I do? I now have to consider the source. This is very powerful stuff. Mm -hmm. Hurt people do what? Hurt people. Right. Most of these people that hurt you, hurt me, hurt people, they hurt people. Mm -hmm. So I consider the source of what that person did to me. It's not going to help me to try to get even. Mm -hmm. I have to consider the source that they were hurt in some form or fashion. And they came against me out of that place. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Even if they're a major manipulator, that's still coming from their pain. Yeah. So how do we process that? How do you think someone should? I mean, it sounds great. Yeah. It sounds you know, great. Oh, let me just 
yeah. figure out the source and then let it go. But okay. some people deal with a lot of emotional pain. These triggers aren't just easily forgettable. Okay. What's the process? Should they hire a coach? Should they write down some exercises? What what should they do, you think? The the process is is that you have to then rearrange what's in your life. And that's why so many therapists, I work with the greatest therapist on the planet. Yeah. I just talked to two today because a lot of the entertainers I work with, I work with them plus a therapist. Mm-hmm. Is that you have to start reaching for things that are healthy. Yeah. So let's say a person that goes through a breakup, which is happens in a lot of counseling I do. The lady may say to me, I was with him. I gave him 27 years of my life. He has an affair with this woman. Okay, she's, she's bleeding. I will suggest things like Pilates, yoga. Many times they get ticked off at me. What's mm-hmm. that going to help me with? For what he did, Pilates, <laughs> yoga. Meditation. Yes. Read the School of Greatness. Okay. <laughs> yes. All right. Painting. Go to one of those classes where they paint mm-hmm. and drink wine. Do something different. Yeah. Okay. Fill yourself with positive things. It's like people that are trying to lose weight. A really good coach will go into the refrigerator, remove all the awful stuff, and put healthy things in the refrigerator. Mm-hmm. So you got to start making healthy things more accessible. I love that. Yeah. Just your fill yourself up with good positivity and you're going to start to feel better. It, heck yeah. It'll change you. Yeah. Absolutely. And I know this because I, I work with people even this morning that have gone through awful things in this works. Mm-hmm. Yeah, of course. What do you tell people that feel like they haven't found out what their mission or their purpose is? Um, they're not sure why they're here. Yes. What they should be doing. What do you, how do you guide them through that process of discovering? Yes. Number one, be patient Mm because hopefully your life is going to be a marathon, not a sprint. Right, right, right. So be patient with yourself. Mm -hmm. Some things you decide, some things you discover. I think in your life that most of what I'm hearing from you, you've discovered. Mm -hmm. I don't think you just sat on a United flight one day (laughs) coming from Hawaii and said, you know, I think I'm going to be me. (laughs) Right, right, right. Okay. And so, and then I want to give you props because I was telling you about a friend of mine mm-hmm. that, um, Sean Cannell, that told me about you. Mm. And and a lot of people are in my ear about stuff. And I got so much going on, I don't always like pay attention to it all. But he's like, dude, you got to get into Sean Cannell. I mean, you got to get into your life, into Lewis. And so he, he showed me some information uh-huh. on you. And so could you imagine in your life, because you discovered this next step of your life Mm -hmm. that now you're impacting even some of us that are in this business. That's pretty cool, right? That's very cool. So again, some things in life you decide, some things you discover. The discover usually happens when you don't expect it. You're sitting somewhere and you go, man, people are hurting. I'm going to help the homeless. Mm Mm-hmm. Or, man, I love art. I think I'm going to start painting. Some of the greatest people that I've worked with, like uh, Vidal Sassoon, who is my buddy, eating breakfasts on on Cannon Drive in Beverly Hills. That was something he discovered, being Vidal Sassoon. Mm. It was something that came out of him. Yes. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. I love that. A few questions left for you, and this has been inspiring, so thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. What's one question? We I asked you this beforehand, but what's one question that you've that, that no one's really ever asked you that you wish they would ask and that you could answer? Yeah, no one has ever asked me. Can can everybody be great in a big way? Okay, so can everyone okay. be great in a big way? Well, because here's here's what when people think of greatness, they think of like right now, they think of Richard Branson. Mm-hmm. Okay, they think of Elon Musk. Right. They think of these guys that are over the top and have potential to send stuff to the moon. Mm, yeah, exactly. Literally. Right. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's, that's what these guys are up right, to. Right, right, right. With their hobbies. Yes. <laughs> so I think we need to just really get honest here. Okay. All right. So can everyone be great? Can anybody? Can everybody be great in this grandiose <laughs> way? Can they? Can they be great? Kids want to believe they can. That's why they have their own Instagrams. On that, they're great. On their Facebook, they're great. Can everybody be great in a big way? 
So I say yes. Hmm. But what you consider great may be different than what another person hmm. considers great. I love it. Because to me, greatness is being a mother of three and you're an awesome mother, but you maybe never wrote a best-selling book. Right, exactly. So that's where guys like us need to really <clears throat> pull people into their own greatness, right? Mm -hmm. That's part of what you're doing. Yes. Because it's all relative. It is, yes. I'm gonna, right. I, my last question you'll be able to answer is, is close to what you're talking about, so I'm yeah. excited to hear. So, so, yeah, so I think no one's ever asked me that question, and I think that, like, for me, I don't chase dreams. You notice I'm very laid back, and I got a lot of good stuff going on. I don't chase dreams. I cooperate with them. It's a mm. big difference. Mm, I'm not good. chasing anything. I turn stuff down that people think is great. Like, yeah. you could have your own talk show, daytime. I'm not in the mood right now. <laughs> right. I might be in three years. Right, right. I love it. Yeah. Do you think? So you think we're all born uh, with – for the potential to be great then? We're all 100%. Yeah. You're born to maximize your life. Mm -hmm. Yes. So if you're an inner city school teacher making 33000 mm -hmm. a year, in my opinion, you're just as great as Warren Buffett mm -hmm. if that's what Buffett's been called to do. Right. I love it. Um, if you had someone handed you a trillion dollars, let's say, and said you get to solve or an unlimited amount of money that would solve one problem in the world, and you had the power to choose one thing out there to solve and say instantly it's it's fixed or in the next couple of years it's going to be solved through this money. What would that thing be that you would put the money towards? That is a that is a great question. Mm. Not even a good <laughs> question. That is that is a great question. I would say that I would solve a problem having to do with an illness okay and i would say obviously there's so many that we'd mm -hmm. like to solve but i would i would solve the problem of cancer you know when you when you see these um athletes because we both love sports and yes. they're wearing pink and they're because in that case it's it's uh, breast awareness or cancer you know, month cancer, right cancer yeah. awareness breast, month breast cancer month yeah and you 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 see the awareness and you and I go to some of these Beverly Hills functions and about cancer and the whole live strong. To be on the inside of, of watching someone die of cancer, to see the, the suffering and the agony that happens in so many cases, mm -hmm. to, be, to be able to eliminate that form of death that would be something that I would do. And you've experienced this firsthand. You've seen yes, it. Yeah. And, and it's not even in family members. It's in people that I help, in families, life coaching people, to see that type of illness and how it takes somebody down. Yeah, I would, I would eliminate that wow. with, with my money. That's powerful. Final few questions. Tim, what are you most grateful for in your life recently? I am grateful for the peace I have in my mind. I think that, I think a lot of people don't have peace. Um, I'm in these houses. Mm -hmm. I'm in the biggest houses in, in the, world. the planet. <laughs> yeah. I'm in the biggest ones in all countries, and I meet with senators, presidents, leaders, people who can buy and sell everything, and see that they have no peace. I am more most grateful that I have peace in my life. Mm. I can go to sleep with the TV off and be at peace. I can drive and not have the music on and be at peace. I could see somebody be better than what I do, maybe they're three times better, and be at peace. I have peace, and man, you can't pay <clears throat> for that. That's great. Uh, this is a question I like to ask everyone. Uh, it's the last day for you. Mm -hmm. Many, many years, decades from now. Yeah, I'm 103. Yes. And um, every book you've ever written, every speech you've ever given, every video online article is erased for some reason that you've ever created. Yes. Any word you've ever put out is gone, except for the memories of people listening to it. And all your friends and family are there. You're at peace mentally, emotionally, everything, physically. And they say everything's erased, but we have a piece of paper 
Yes. And you get to write down three truths. Yes. Three things that you know to be true about everything you've experienced that you could pass on to us is essentially our Bible of your wisdom. Yes. Three lessons. What would you write down as your three truths? Okay. Number one, I, I got to go to my spiritual base. And that is, is that truly that God has a plan for our lives. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him. He shall direct your path. So number one truth is God has a plan for your life. Okay? Mm -hmm. Secondly, is that God is okay with you. Psalms 103, God does not treat you as your sins deserve. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those that honor him. See, people need to know that. I think people who aren't even spiritual and who think they don't even believe in God are trying to chase something because they don't know that life is okay with them. Mm. So God has a plan and God's okay with it. Okay? And the third is, this thing I said to you earlier, is that you may not be what you want to be, but thank God you're not what you used to be. Mm. In other words, give yourself some doggone credit for your growth. Right. Right? Yeah. No matter what you've been through, mm. if a guy that's listening or watching today has been divorced five times, if he was incarcerated 27 years, at that moment you're not. Mm. You may not be what you want to be, but thank God you're not what you used to be. Be okay. Mm. with that i love that those are great truths um before i ask the final question i want to acknowledge you tim for your incredible contribution and gift that you bring to the world i think it's amazing i'm so glad we got connected and i'm so glad to hear about how you support so many of our youth in teaching them how to dream but also yes. supporting so many of uh you know the world's leaders to overcome their obstacles their distractions their stories so that they can inspire more people as well so i want to acknowledge you for your incredible gifts for your constant commitment year after year decade after decade of stepping up into your best self and for probably the biggest thing being at peace because i think that's a big thing that most of us haven't figured out yet so yes. i acknowledge you for leading the way and i thank you for that yes and i i i embrace your words mm -hmm. And I will say this, that I'm so proud of you. Mm. Mostly at your stage of life, the influence that life is mm. giving you and the way you're handling the platform. So thank you. right back at you. I appreciate that. Thanks. Uh, before I ask the final question, uh, where can we connect with you? What should we do? TimStory.com, S-T-O-R-E-Y.com. Yes. Go sign up for his newsletter. Check out all your videos. You've got great stuff there. Mm -hmm. There's a great video of you speaking with Oprah on her yes. stage. I recommend checking that out first. Mm -hmm. And also you're on Instagram and Twitter and everywhere, right? right? So, yeah, if they go to TimStory.com, that'll be my universe. Mm -hmm. We're doing some great projects uh, coming up. You can get on Tim Story on demand and get a lot of information that we do. You can also go to Oprah.com and see things that we're doing with her. And we have some new projects going on with uh, with her and her company. But TimStory.com. Perfect. And come to the Bible study. Check it out. Come yes. see you in person. Mm -hmm. you got all the information there. And your whole touring, you've got it all up there, right? It's all there. Awesome. Perfect. And the final question is, and you almost alluded to it earlier, it's what's your definition of greatness? Definition of greatness. Definition of of greatness um, three levels of living almost most and utmost almost means not quite so greatness is not to be almost it's the opposite of almost it's to manifest an utmost life that makes one great so you know you're not being great when you're almost you're the mm -hmm. opposite I almost got the job. I was almost happy. I was almost this. I was almost that. The opposite of that is to manifest an utmost life, which is a life of greatness. Mm. Tim Story, thanks for coming on, man. Appreciate it. This was great. Hey, guys, thanks so much for watching this video. I really appreciate it. And if you enjoyed this 
video, then make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel. You can do that by clicking right here to subscribe because each week we come out with awesome, epic, and inspiring interviews and messages and videos just for you. So click subscribe right here to get notified of new videos every week. Also, if you enjoyed this specific interview, we've got a lot of great interviews like this that are uplifting and inspiring. So click right here to watch the previous interviews because the people I've had on are pretty cool and epic as well. So click here to watch previous interviews. Click here to subscribe. I love you guys, and I'll see you very soon.